Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Alex Halliday. Uh, I am the director of Columbia University's Earth Institute. Uh, it is my pleasure to welcome so many of you joining us from so many different parts of the, the world and the United States. I'm hitting, sitting here up in Manhattan uh, next to Columbia University. It's seven o'clock and everybody's out there banging their saucepans together to support all the healthcare workers in the area. And so if you want to bang a saucepan, it's absolutely fine. Feel free to do so. We should support our healthcare workers. So um, anyway, uh, this pandemic emergency has forced many changes upon us, of course. Uh, we originally scheduled this lecture for back in early March and would have met in a relatively small venue with a limited number of invited guests. And uh, even in those early days, we thought it was too risky to go ahead with that. And so out of an abundance of caution, we postponed and now bring you this discussion via Zoom instead. We are thrilled that this format has, format has actually opened up this conversation to so many of you. Um, during the second half of tonight's program, we will welcome audience Q&A. Uh, it is very likely we'll not get to all of your questions given the size of the audience. So I think we have over 2000 people registered. Uh, we will be following up with those who uh, we are not, those questions we're not able to address. But uh, feel free to get in touch with your questions uh, and they will be fed um, to me to put to our speakers uh, later on uh, in the program. So first of all, let me just bring you a bit of background on who we are. Uh, the Earth Institute's purpose is to bring together top Earth and environmental scientists, economists, lawyers, public health and business policy experts. Increasingly, we're looking at other areas of the arts, humanities, social sciences as well, and particularly thinking about areas like ethics uh, and the effect climate change is having on people's, uh, even their psychiatric well, their psychological well-being. So there are lots of different ways in which climate and energy are affecting uh, people and their lives. And the Earth Institute's goal is to try and uh, look at these profound challenges that are facing humanity. Uh, the most striking and urgent of these is climate change. Uh, and today we have this lecture entitled Power on the Planet, Energy Policy Solutions. We're going to focus on the power grid and how it contributes to global warming. Uh, it's a complex system with myriad ramifications, which are not just about energy solutions as in engineering, uh, it's also about social acceptance, impacts in terms of health, et cetera, and uh, sustainable societies more broadly. Uh, so tonight we have joining us two leading experts in their fields. Um, the first is David Sandelow. He's the inaugural fellow at the Center on Global Energy Policy and co-director of the Energy and Environment Concentration at the School of International and Public Affairs at Columbia University. He, is, he founded and directs the center's United States China program and is author of the Guide to Chinese Climate Policy. More about that later on. Mr. Sandlow has served in senior positions at the White House, State Department and US Department of Energy. He writes and speaks widely on climate change and energy policy. Recent works include Industrial Heat Decarbonization Roadmap, which came out uh, just in December, a Guide to Chinese Climate Policy, which came out in uh, September, and Electrical Vehicle Charging in China and the United States, which came out in February of last year. So these are uh, really amazing contributions. It's wonderful to have him here tonight. Also with us here is this evening is Dr. Melissa Lott, who's recently joined us at Columbia University. Melissa is Senior Research Scholar at the Center on Global Energy Policy. Uh, she has worked as an engineer, and advisor for more than 15 years in the United States, Europe, and Asia. While her work has spanned the entire energy system, she is internationally recognized for her work in the electricity and transportation sectors. For her research and contributions to global energy sector dialogues, Melissa has been featured as a Solar 100 thought leader, an IEEE Women in Power, and a Forbes 30 under 30 in energy. She specializes in technology and policy research, working to increase our understanding of the impacts of our energy systems on air pollution and public health. So we're gonna begin our program with both of our speakers giving just a very brief introduction to their work. Over to you, David. David, you need to unmute. David, you're muted. 
Alex, thank you so much for having me. And this is a great event that you and your colleagues at the Earth Institute have pulled together. I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I have long been interested both in protecting the environment and in the energy system. That really, for me, that started at a very young age. It started uh, love of hiking and canoeing and love of nature. And that led to a uh, real passion for protect, protecting the environment. And the energy system is so entwined with the environment that I've been working on energy for many years. And at the same time, um, I've been fascinated by China since I, was, since I was a boy. When I was a boy, actually, Americans couldn't travel to China. It was literally illegal for us to do it. We didn't have diplomatic relations. But that changed when I was in college. And right afterwards, I managed to get on one of the first exchange programs headed uh, of, of US students going to China. We studied in Shanghai in the summer of 1981. It was actually a Columbia Law School program. So Columbia's history in China goes back a long ways. And these things have converged to work on both uh, energy and climate change in particular, because it's such a pressing problem, and uh, with a real focus on China, because you know, China is, it's today, it's the largest greenhouse gas emitter in the world by far and drives energy markets in many ways. So um, it's been a real privilege for me for the past seven years now to be part of the Center on Global Energy Policy at, at Columbia University, a really extraordinary institution that is growing dramatically, um, doing work, the intersection of energy, environment, geopolitics, um, trying to inform policymakers and thought leaders more generally about what's happening in these issues around the world. Thanks, David. Melissa, give us an introduction to your work. Uh, thanks, Alex, and just a quick thank you to the whole team that worked so diligently to put this event together, um, especially in the midst of everything that's going on, and to take it from that in-person uh, idea that we had for the beginning of March and transforming it into this tonight. Um, as you mentioned, I'm a senior scholar at the Center on Global Energy Policy at Columbia, and I joined last year, though I've known uh, a number of folks in the center, including our director, Jason Bordoff, for over a decade at this point. Um, at the center, as you know, I lead something called the Power Sector and Renewables Research Initiative. And our team there focuses on providing a lot of clarity and context for stuff that's going on in the power sector right now, which I mean, quite bluntly, if I summarized it, would be just a really rapid transition, some of which is motivated by climate change and are you know, striving to reduce emissions, but also by the rapid technology change that we've seen in the system. So it's social, as you said, and also technology and engineering. Um, my own research in this area focuses on some key questions looking at the impacts of energy systems on climate change, air pollution, and public health, with the goal of that work really being to say, okay, how can we make practically informed decisions as we work to mobilize these technology and policy solutions? How, how do we do that? How do we avoid pitfalls that we wouldn't see if we didn't bring in really interdisciplinary folks to look at this problem from a lot of different ways and a lot of different lenses? As we know, and most of the people who are probably attending tonight know, the power sector is a key contributor to greenhouse gas emissions. It's also the backbone of really any practical pathway to achieving decarbonization targets, to minimizing the effects of climate change. So if you look at, I mean, you can pick, pick your favorite, whether it's from the International Energy Agency, the US Department of Energy, the IPCC, or the Deep Decarbonization Pathways Project, all of them say, if we want to practically decarbonize, we're going to need to, A, take away the carbon emissions that are coming from the power sector, shift that, and also use a lot more electricity for a lot more things. So how do we do that? And how do we do that on a time scale that matters? And uh, you know, in my own work, I focus on public health because we see, okay, how do we do this while maximizing the public health benefit? How do we do that? Um, and there's a lot of uh, nerdy numbers and language that goes into it from engineering background and also great contributions from policy practitioners within the center, et cetera. But that in a nutshell, I'll leave it there is, is my work and what I do. And Melissa, how did you actually get into this in the first place? What was it, what was it that got you into this field of study? Yeah, so um, I think similar to David, you know, when I was growing up, a lot of my years were spent as a, a child of a military family on the West Coast in a place called Monterey, California, um, where the environment was right in front of your face. It's, uh, if you go to Monterey, we basically have the Grand Canyon underwater there. And so we spent a lot of time in our schools and in our lives protecting that. And when I looked you know, in college at different things that I could do, I ran into an energy research project and I quickly realized how fundamentally important energy is in protecting our environment, in protecting our health, in just the entire sustainability conversation. If you ignore energy, I don't think you get to where you wanna go. 
There's other important components in as well, but that just spoke to me. Um, I also was a, an engineer, a real, real math and science person. I was minoring in physics, for goodness sakes. You know, I was, I was that, that sciencey person. And I realized that the challenges I was running into, I had the technical solution for them. Like I could fix it with the tech, you know, fix it with my technology that I had, you know, virtually in my hands. Yeah. And I went, wait, this is more than that. And so that's when I started going into policy and everything else. But it's really motivated by this concept um, that was instilled in me from, I mean, longer than I can remember, which is leave this world a better place than when I came into it. Do what you can to positively impact things. It's that. But it started environment and then energy just grabbed me and let me go. <laughs> and David, it's a bit the same with you. You started off in broader aspects of the environment, I think. And then you got in, you're working with Bill Clinton and Al Gore at one point, right? So... I, I did, yeah. I had it's a great privilege. I worked for for President Clinton and Vice President Gore on the National Security Council staff in the 1990s, working on the climate change issue. And um, it's actually a U.S. representative at the first conference of the parties, the Framework Convention on Climate Change, back in 1995. Um, and uh, by the way, that that uh, that conference was held in Berlin, Germany, and it was chaired by a dynamic young environment minister of Germany, whose name was Angela Merkel. Um, who's gone around some other things. So um, she's really been involved in this issue for, for many years. And, and um, yeah, and, and, and for me that, you know, as I was saying earlier, the climate change and the energy issues just intersect in, in such a powerful way. And it, I mean, it's one of the reasons I love Columbia actually, because Columbia University has got extraordinary expertise in the natural sciences. It's got extraordinary ex expertise in engineering in policy and business and um, really comes together in a world-class university where we're able to provide insights that, that I hope can help change the world. Yeah, no, I think you're entirely right there. It's, a, it's, a, it's by far the best, I think, in terms of tackling these transdisciplinary issues of uh, sustainability. So uh, talking about transdisciplinary issues, we're in the middle of a pandemic and, uh, and not quite sure how far along we are. Actually, maybe middle is the wrong way to put it. Um, it's created an unexpected benefit, and that is, of course, to do with um, clean air. And is there some way in which the impact on air quality during this amazing time informs our energy policies? How would you characterize the severity and urgency of the need to change our energy policy in the light of this? Or do you think it will actually lead to us taking more aggressive action to do so? Melissa? I mean, when it comes to what's going on right now, it's, it's a really interesting um, experiment that we're all participating in, one that we never would have chosen to, given the circumstances, but it's showing us what is possible in our system. Um, right now we're seeing that renewables is one example. Renewables are up while pretty much every other source of energy is down. Like we're seeing declining demand for oil, gas, coal across the board, but renewables are up. We're seeing that um, our air is getting cleaner and we're able to really learn and understand from that, okay, what can we do in, in terms of pulling quick levers? I think there's certainly an opportunity for policy here. There's certainly an opportunity to take some of that momentum and say, okay, how do we, how do we do this in the future as smoothly as possible? How do, as we reboot the economy and bring things back online, how do we do that in a way that is going to protect public health? Um, it also is showing us on a really basic level where we might encounter issues in the future as we do this over time. So as we increase the amount of renewables in our electricity system here in the US, what are some pinch points gonna be? What are some tough points that we need to go ahead and be implementing technology to solve? So there's certainly an opportunity. David, I don't know if you wanna talk about federal opportunities there. Yeah, I think, I mean, I completely agree with what Melissa just said. And I think a couple of observations first, you know, greenhouse gas emissions have just dropped more in the past quarter than they have ever dropped in history. It's pretty striking. Um, but it's also in some ways pretty sobering. Um, the, much of the world has shut down in the past few months and greenhouse gas emissions have only fallen by roughly 8% or 10% in that period. And I think it underscores the enormous transition that we need to make over the course of the next several decades in order to come to grips with the climate change problem. And, and it goes without saying that we're not gonna do that by shutting down the economy. We're not, that's, that's not the path to a solution. The path to a solution is a transition to lower carbon energy sources, to more sustainable practices and agriculture and in land use, a variety of other methods that, that require pretty big systemic changes. It's a huge challenge. It's a challenge of the nature that we, I think we haven't seen before. Um, 
But I think one lesson that comes from this pandemic that, that is hugely important is, is the respect for expertise and attention to, to facts and science are absolutely essential. Um, and um, you know, countries around the world that have paid more attention to um, scientific, you know, the, the, the science of epidemiology um, are doing better right now in managing both the health risks and the economic risks from the pandemic. Uh, and and I think it's a lesson that applies in climate change as well. Yeah, I think that's true. And science, we need, I mean, the scientific evidence is overwhelming around climate change. And actually that has to inform policy. A lot of the solutions are not that straightforward. And um, maybe one of the most striking tricky areas is decarbonizing industry. I mean, we've, we've focused a lot on electric vehicles and people have started thinking about how to uh, do things differently in terms of renewables, et cetera. But um, how are we gonna decarbonize industry, David? Any thoughts on that? It's such an important question. Thank you for asking. So 10% of global emissions right now, of global greenhouse gas emissions come from just producing heat for industry. And industries create lots of other emissions too, but 10% but of emissions just from creating heat, and that's more than cars and planes combined. Um, and so this right is smelting and things like this and blast furnaces and exactly for for the iron and steel industry for cement industry for chemicals industry for a number of other industries yeah. uh, high high quality high grade heat is absolutely essential for the for those industries and unfortunately for for um for the climate change issue and for the atmosphere fossil fuels are just very good at producing high grade heat they they burn at high temperatures you can turn them on and off there's a global infrastructure to provide um the fossil fuels and so we need to find a way to, in ways to transition away from those fossil fuels to produce heat for industry, but we're not nearly as far along in that effort as we are in say decarbonizing the power industry. In the power industry, we've had, Melissa's a global expert on this, but in the power industry, we have had rapid drops in the prices of solar power and wind power, which we, we have a line of sight to see how we can decarbonize the power sector, even though we're not there yet, but we at least have a line of sight on how to do it. In the industrial sector, I think we're much further away and the strategies include electrifying some processes, maybe using biomass, um, maybe using hydrogen, um, to, which can combust at high temperatures, uh, carbon capture utilization and storage, um, all those. So, if you're interested in this, by the way, we did a roadmap, um, released a roadmap on these topics, which you mentioned earlier, um, Alex, and, and one of my colleagues at the Center of Global Energy Policy, Julio Friedman, has done a, a, another paper on this, which I recommend to anybody um, who's interested in the topic. It's, it's a really important topic that doesn't get enough attention in relation to its importance on the global warming issue. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Melissa, you've focused on health impacts as well uh, on global energy use. Do you believe do you believe this is underappreciated as a risk? I mean, we we, wor we worry about, you know, what's going to happen with extreme events and 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 um, and you know the loss of GDP, and we worry about you know what may happen to communities. Tell us about health, though. Why is health so intimately tied up with the energy issues? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great question. I mean, in my work, if I had to generalize, there are always exceptions, of course, but if I had to generalize, I often find people who focus on climate and health or climate and energy, but really understanding this nexus between climate, energy and health and how, you know, you can, you can wish that you could assume that actions to mitigate climate change, to um, decarbonize the energy system would be good for health, that it's just all co-benefits. But the reality is it's, it's co-impacts. There are pluses and minuses. There are trade-offs across the road. And so there's a couple of different interesting points that when we do the analysis and we look at the numbers that we see, and one is that, you know, these these kind of efforts to protect our health, a health first pathway can actually accelerate decarbonization in the near term. So right now we're not nearly drawing down, I'm gonna suspend what's going on at this moment, of course, um, but we're not drawing down emissions as quickly as, as we need to, to really reach our targets or the things that we set out in Paris well below too. I mean, we're just not on track for it. If you look at the nationally determined contributions and, and the initial mid-century strategies, like the few that have come out. Um, and so if we look at health, it's a way to actually accelerate it because by reducing some types of air pollution, we can reduce carbon emissions. Um, on the other side of it, I often hear people saying, climate change will hurt our health um, in 30 years, 50 years, 100 years. It's 
going to hurt my children's health or my grandchildren's health. And the reality is it's already hurting our health today. And the evidence is, is really clear on this. And there's a, a paper that we publish every year in the Lancet Medical Journal. And it's a collaboration of, of academics around the world, um, including myself, uh, that looks at, okay, what are the health risks that we have in the future, but what are we already experiencing right now? Um, so let's look at heat stress. So let's look at you know, all the different types of things that are happening now. I focus in on air pollution from vehicles and power plants and how that's affecting our lungs and our bodies. But um, I think this highlights a few things such as it's a tough problem. It's not all clear winners and bells and rings, and we need to have a lot of people from a lot of different disciplines studying it and showing us, okay, how, how do we avoid these pitfalls that we could have? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, are, there, um, are there particular ways in which you think we can, things we can particularly do as individuals to reduce this threat uh, in some way? Absolutely, I mean, we can do things in our everyday lives, um, you know, some things are, are quite easy, some things are perhaps more difficult or more out of reach if you don't have the financial resources to do it, but we can do things to be more efficient in our own energy use, to invest in things that are reduce our footprint. But, um, you know, to the point that David's already introduced, which is just, we need some fundamental structural changes if we really want to reduce emissions over time, like we need to, to achieve the targets we're hoping to achieve to protect health. And so, you know, each one of us has the ability to, you know, use our voice and use our minds to support initiatives that are pushing to bring this down. So to let people know this is important to us and that we want action on this um, to get to whatever our personal goals are. So we can do things in our everyday lives to be more energy efficient. Um, if you have the resources for it, you can buy an electric car as one example. You can use public transportation more than you perhaps you know did before but it's really about pushing for those big structural changes and supporting that action there and do you think countries are getting together and talking about i mean the european union of course tried to get deal with this issue together and of course and then of course the european union breaks up <laughs> the point is that the um at some level um you know people have been aware of the health issues uh to some extent and at the same time they've also uh, been struggling with the competition between trying to improve living standards and have more industrialization going on and and more money in the system or people getting cars which all seems like such a benefit to society um, at the same time as they were nobody really sort of paid much attention to air pollution very much and now air pollution is getting uh, quite a lot of coverage not just in some of the cities around the world which where have long been known which have long been known to be problematic, but even places like New York and London and places like that. Um, is this something where you think there's going to be sort of some kind of a global effort to do something on this, or is it really something that has to be sorted out at the local level? I, mean, I think when it comes to air pollution, what I'm seeing is that it's be starting to be sorted out on the local level for a couple of different reasons. Um, on the global level, what I am seeing is a conversation that's turning around, and we had this idea that increasing energy access, so access to modern energy services, that was in somehow in tension with mitigating climate change. We give people access and, and it's going to make emissions worse, okay? And you kind of ended up in this discussion about morals and ethics, and, and then we paused and went, wait, are we sure that that's actually what happens? And so the International Energy Agency, I think it was three years ago now, they came out with a report where they ran the numbers and they said, what happened? to greenhouse gas emissions if we get people off of dung and woody biomass and actually move them to having access to electricity that then they can use. They have a certain access to a certain level of it, um, moving them away from these, these things that produce not only uh, greenhouse gas emissions, but they produce a lot of air pollution and make people ill in their homes. And the numbers, um, I, you know, I, I know the two lead authors, two uh, extremely talented women who ran that project, and they said, yeah, we ran the numbers because, of course, we had to answer the question of what the impacts on greenhouse gases would be. We were shocked because it actually showed that you give people access and emissions go down. So air pollution goes down and emissions go down. That's a clear win. Um, as we talk about developing, what I see in some countries um, that I won't name specifically just because it's a mix of conversations, some open, some not. Um, but I've been in conversations with a number of governments. Before I came to Columbia, I was leading um, at the Asia Pacific Energy Research Center, a, a series of initiatives of 21 different countries. Um, and we're talking, you know, 
16 on one side of the Pacific, five on the other. So you had the US, Canada, um, and then also you know, Russia, China, Southeast Asia, you went to Papua New Guinea, 14% electrification. But essentially there's this increasing awareness that if we look at the numbers and we look at the development pathway that like China has followed, other countries have followed, there's, there is a trade-off if you go a very heavy, pollu heavy pollution route after a point. And so when I'm talking to um, governments in some countries that have a very significant future impact and even current impact, Impact on emissions, they're asking the question of, okay, what's the alternative? And with costs being so much lower for some of these alternatives now than they were before, than they were a decade or two before, um, they're saying, okay, how do I avoid these pitfalls and avoid these GDP compromises? So some of the tensions that we thought were just the nature of the beast not too long ago are starting to ease up. And those conversations, they are local to your question. Um, they're also very exciting if we can follow through on them. The risk is with everything that's going on right now, as the economies you know, around the world are slowing down and kind of stalling out a bit, as we try to turn them back on, if we double down on these high polluting things, we're, we're gonna see some big impacts there um, that won't be, won't be very good. Yeah, so oh, okay. yeah, David, let's bring you in. Actually, David, we're gonna have to keep an eye on the time because I wanna start opening up the questions to Q&A in about 12 minutes. But one thing I wanted to move on to you, talk about David is China, which of course is, unrelated to air pollution um, but you're a leader in this particular area and you're just about to you've just got your um, 2020 edition that you're updating at the moment on Chinese on China energy, energy policy um, in the guide you note that in some ways China is a leader in fighting climate change but in other ways the country lags um, it's the world's largest emitter of co2 how is how is it actually how is this this discordant energy policy really playing out and impacting climate change. Um, and in particular, how are they gonna deal with it in terms of future energy policy? Uh, Alex, let me answer your question about climate in particular, but also make a comment on air pollution. Because as, as Melissa was talking, I was remembering a meal I had in Beijing about two years ago on a very cold winter day, the restaurant. And I was, I told the waitress who was serving me that I was about to fly down to the southernmost part of China. Um, it was very warm. Um, and she said, oh, you're so lucky. And I expected her to say, because it's so warm down there. And instead what she said is because there's no PM 2.5 down there. And PM 2.5 is the measure of air pollution that stands for particulate matter 2.5. Um, and everybody in Northern China is always talking about PM 2.5 and looking at their apps on their phone to find what PM 2.5 measure is. You know, air, air pollution in northern China has been a major political issue for almost a decade, for more than a decade now. Um, and, uh, and there's actually been some pretty significant progress in cleaning it up. Um, it's uh, still a significant issue, but you look at the data, it's much better than it was a while ago. And that's, there's a relationship between that and climate change, because many of the measures that are used to fight um, local air pollution also are very helpful in fighting climate change. Um, to answer your specific question about climate change, uh, um, as I mentioned earlier, China is the biggest greenhouse gas emitter on the planet. Last year, emissions from China were about as much as emissions from the U.S. and Europe and India combined. So hugely important. Yeah. You know, at the same t at the same time, um, emissions uh, of carbon dioxide, in particular, once once they're put in the atmosphere, they stay there for hundreds of years or some fraction of the, the dust. And cumulative emissions from China since you know, the beginning of the Industrial Revolution are only about half of the United States. So it kind of depends how you measure it. Um, but, but China is a, a huge, huge force here. And, and their policies both um, do some very important things to help fight climate change, but also they have some policies that are very damaging. And since we're short on time, I'll say just very quickly. First, China leads the world in renewable energy deployment by far biggest solar deployer, biggest wind deployer, biggest hydro deployer for each of the past 10 years. Um, China leads the world in electric vehicle deployment. Last year, more than half of the electric vehicles in the world sold were in China. This is more controversial, but China also leads the world in nuclear power deployment. Of the nine nuclear plants open in the world in the past two years, seven of them were in China. Um, uh, China has forestry policies and energy efficiency policies, both of which make a big difference. Where really there's a big problem in China right now is in coal, in coal, in the utilization of coal. And China continues to build coal-fired power plants at a very fast pace. And China 
Chinese government is financing the construction of coal-fired power plants around the world right now. It's one of only three governments in the world that finances coal-fired power plants abroad, and its funding is by far bigger than any other. So it's a complicated story. One piece, there are no climate deniers in the Chinese government, at least, at least none that have any obvious influence on policy. Uh, the Chinese leadership uh, speaks about the importance of climate change and fighting climate change. It's, it's, it's not the top priority to be sure, but, but there's no denial of the fact that climate change is a serious issue that needs to be addressed within the, within the Chinese system. So, I mean, just before you move, we move on, uh, uh, I want to get back to Melissa, but um, electric vehicles. America has been a bit slow by comparison with China, I guess. Is that fair to say? And are there any things we've got to learn from China on this? Uh, uh, yes. You know, um, uh, about half of the electric vehicles in the United States are in California. Um, so the California state government and a few other state governments have been very proactive in promoting electrification of the vehicle fleet. Um, but not nearly as ambitious as the Chinese government has been on this. And the Chinese government has provided a range of policy supports, including subsidies for manufacturers, um, uh, tax exemptions, and actually with what works best in the Chinese system, interestingly, is special rules on license plates. It's very hard to get license plates for your cars because of traffic controls in China, but if you have an electric vehicle, you get a license plate much more quickly, and you're not subject to various other restrictions. Um, I, it, yes, I think the United States does have um, things to learn from, from China on this, and China has things to learn from the United States. We can, we can learn from each other, um, and, uh, and I'll just make one general point about that because you know the U.S.-China relations right now have gotten to I think their lowest point since the normalization of relations uh, more than 40 years ago. Uh, I think that has I think it is it is sad it's tragic for the planet that our two yeah. countries are not working together to fight this pandemic but instead are engaged in a series of kind of tit-for-tat criticisms and it's people are suffering as a result of that and I think the same thing uh, it's true on climate change. Uh, when the US and China got together to work on climate change um, six, about six years ago, it helped to galvanize the world to reach agreement in Paris. Um, and I think we're the two largest emitters of the world. We have to get together to work on this issue. It's, it's just hugely important. Yeah, absolutely. Melissa, you're about to release a couple of reports on corporations, I think, right? And uh, and in helping us move more quickly uh, towards a low, low carbon electricity. Why is this an important question? And, and can you tell us a bit about what you found in the reports? Yeah, I mean, there's this, so we're about to release a couple of reports that focus on um, different procurement practices that corporations have when it comes to renewables. I mean, if you look at a number of companies in the United States and abroad who have really pushed forward and said, okay, irregardless of where you know the nation or the state or the region that I'm in is going, we're going low carbon, that's happening. And we did a study looking at one of the biggest trends that's um, going on right now, which is these targets towards, I'm going 100% renewable energy. So I'm going to do that for, for my company. And we looked at it from a technical standpoint and also from a, a business and, and future, you know, how do we achieve deep decarbonization standpoint? So point one is many of these companies right now, I mean, they've undoubtedly had positive impacts. If you define positive impacts as being more renewables, more low carbon resources on the system, like they have driven that. Yeah. Um, but most of these companies right now, as step one in their process, uh, they've said, okay, we're going to procure enough electricity to meet our demand on an annual basis. So we use 10 units of electricity. We will make sure we have 10 units units of solar or wind or some combination thereof on the system during the year. But practically speaking, if we want to really deeply decarbonize the power system, we need to look at it on a much more granular level than that. And what I mean by that is looking at it as instantaneously or at least hourly, what do we need on the system? Um, and to make sure that our needs and the supply that is coming from renewables and low carbon resources um, match up. And the reason this is important, so in this analysis, we said, okay, where's the current gap? and what can be done about it? And what could the next generation of corporate procurement and then the next generation of policies really look like to account for this? So that we don't kind of sew ourselves up into a pathway that you know, maybe gets us to 60 or 70% of the solution, but you know, isn't gonna get to that 100%. You know, how do we do that? And in this, um, you know, we've pulled uh, from a bunch of different people's research at Columbia and then also abroad, there's a, 
uh, sorry, at other universities and then abroad. Um, so as one example, there's a professor, um, Jesse Jenkins, who's now at Princeton, but he's looked at, okay, what if we go towards 100% renewable or we say, okay, the goal is reducing emissions. Let's use every tool in our toolbox to do it. Um, and the analogy he uses that I love is if we only go wind and solar, it's kind of like having a diet where we only eat bananas and apples. They're great. We get a good amount of nutrition from the first one or two we eat. If we make that an entire diet, we're gonna need a lot of vitamins or we're gonna be super unhealthy. So by adding in other technologies, you're adding in you know, protein sources, you're adding in carbohydrates, you're adding in all these things that you need to really be a healthy person, or in this case, a healthy the electricity system. So this brings up the nuclear question. What are we going to do with nuclear? What are we going to do with existing nuclear and future nuclear that we you know, may use to replace or may use to expand in different countries? What about fossil fuels with carbon capture and sequestration? Um, our colleague Julio Friedman that David's already mentioned, and then other colleagues um, in our, in our uh, center uh, like Noah Kaufman and others are looking at these questions of what's the right technology mix? What do we need? Um, and you know, we don't want a 60% solution. We want a 100% solution. So what does that look like? Okay, so in a minute, I'm going to ask each of you quickly to give me one thing you would change to, to really change the world. But before we do that, um, uh, can, you just, can we just focus a little bit on developing countries and in particular, um, people who are um, basically starting to suffer as a result of energy policy effectively or lack of energy policy. Why is it that this has a big impact on developing countries or and the, the, and the poorest in society, basically? Melissa, do you want to kick off with this? Um, sure, and then I'm, I'm excited to hear David comment on it. Um, yeah. I wonder if he'll touch on the, is China a developing country conversation as well <laughs> when we get there? I've seeded it already. Um, I mean, when we talk about comprehensive action. I mean, I think when you're looking at developing economies, you know, you need to break them down into different groups. So there are developing economies that are already affected by sea level rise, that are already affected by air pollution challenges, that are already affected by these things. These are not, you know, theoretical future realities. This is what they're seeing right now. And a lack of policies to you know, help them to actually reduce emissions in their areas, to actually improve um, their overall system and quality of life and health as they go and develop and continue. You know, that is something that uh, if you look at the research and you look at the numbers will probably slow down their development at different stages in development. So it will actually slow down their improvements of, you know, quality of life if you measure it on a GDP basis, which is a whole different discussion. Um, but it's also a situation where you know they need contributions and they say you know we need we need help we need input we need collaboration and unfortunately many of the conversations that we have seen developing over i will say at least the past few years if not longer i'm curious what david thinks on that one um have been more divisive than drawing us together to say okay how do we help and we're looking at climate change there's got to be a global solution for this just one country working alone is not nearly enough so how do we get everyone at the table and how do we have those productive conversations that honor, you know, the idea of we want to improve our quality of life and we want to develop, but we also need to reduce emissions. You know, how do we do that? How do we improve our air quality, et cetera? So yeah. David, I'm curious what you're going to say on this one. Yeah. What do you think? That was a great answer, Melissa. And I'm, I was just remembering a conversation I once had with uh, an African diplomat who said to me, you know, climate change, it's kind of like secondhand smoke for us. You know, we, we don't make these gases, you make these gases, they blow across the ocean and they hurt us. And they hurt us actually worse than they hurt you. And I thought it was poignant and true. And, and um, uh, global warming um, is particularly destructive to poorer countries that don't have the resources to adapt. That's true for health systems, that's true for agricultural systems. Um, they're, they're low lying, you know, extremely low lying cities in many poor developing countries that don't have the resources to retreat and, you know, from seacoast. And so it's just, it's a devastating problem in, in the developing countries, in developing countries. And I think, um, we have to work together as a globe to find the uh, both the, the political systems and, uh, and then the new technologies that are going to solve this problem. Okay, so um, we're going to go to Q and A in a second. Just before we do, uh, I just wanted to ask you quickly for what you would name maybe one or two two maximum specific takeaways that you would like 
each audience member to have from tonight's discussion of your work? What do you want them to understand about energy policy that you think is really, really important? Melissa. I get to go first again. Oh my goodness. Um, can I punt to David to go first? Yeah, just because I, I want to, I want to, do you mind, Alex, if I do that? Well, so for me, um, US and China have to work together to fight climate change. Um, there's no solution to climate change that doesn't involve our two countries, and we are stronger working together than we are working alone. Excellent. Great. Melissa? Completely agree with that. Um, I think that when we look at climate change and we look at health and we look at how we can improve, you know, both, so mitigate climate change and improve our health, if we focus on a health first set of policies, if we really look at that, we can get to the goals that we're seeking much more quickly. The evidence is clear on that. So let's talk about climate change as being a real health problem and let's solve that health problem. Let's triage the patient and let's actually treat them. Okay, well, thank you very much indeed. So we've got a, a whole lot of questions coming in. There's about 50 questions coming already. They're being triaged by uh, the team. So there's a lot of questions coming in about nuclear and you sort of touched on nuclear without really saying what you think. So I'd like to hear what you think about what America maybe should do about nuclear power. Or maybe you wanna do it more broadly, but um, let's start with America because it seems to be one of those areas which is messy and nobody knows quite what to do. And yet, would you not call it maybe a renewable energy source? David, what about you? Uh, I would sum this up by saying I am pro-nuclear, but I am not optimistic about nuclear. Uh, I, I, I am, uh, I think low carbon energy is hugely important to the future of the planet. And, and right now, um, uh, nuclear power provides, I think it's in the order of 60, 65% of the zero carbon energy in the United States today. Um, if we had um, cheap, safe, proliferation resistant nuclear power, uh, that could play a very important part in the clean energy transition. And I think that we need to be investing heavily um, in trying to develop those technologies. The, the major challenge in the world today on nuclear power is cost. I th it's, it's, there, are two, there are two significant problems. One is cost and the other is public acceptance. Um, and uh, uh, I remember once, was a, five, maybe eight years or so ago, I was on a, a panel with a, um, the CEO of a, uh, of, a, of a utility that owns lots of nuclear power. And I said something positive about nuclear power. And he said, David, why would anybody build a nuclear plant in the United States today? It doesn't make any sense. It's way out of the money. And that's true. And that's why we haven't had nuclear power plants built here in a long time. I think it, um, if we could bring down costs with small modular reactors or other types of technologies, that, that would be a good thing. And if we could design passively safe nuclear reactors um, that um, uh, wouldn't create, there would be no meltdown risk and, you know, associated with a shutdown or uh, other types of issues. That would be a good thing for the world. But I think we're a long ways away from that right now. Uh, what, I, what I support is heavy investment in nuclear power technologies, um, extending the life of existing nuclear power plants um, in the United States as long as can reasonably done at, at a safe level and working together with partners around the world on these issues. I mean, China is really trying everything, right? I mean, they seem to be doing, really leading the way in this. So yeah, so, so yeah, as I said earlier, you know, um, most of the nuclear plants by far in the world that have built the past couple of years have been built in China. Um, and- uh, They're being quite creative and looking at different solutions, different kinds of nuclear plants, I think. They are, they're important, they're importing technologies from different countries from around the world and, and deciding which ones they want to pursue. And they're developing their own indigenous versions of those technologies. And, um, and developing an infrastructure there. I think th this is just one area where I think cooperation between the United States and China is very important. We, we have over much of the past several decades had a very robust cooperation between the US and China on nuclear safety issues. I worry that in the current period of tensions that that cooperation is, like, is eroding um, and it's extremely important for the world that we maintain the safety of nuclear plants everywhere, wherever they exist. Yeah, okay. Melissa, what about nuclear? 
I saw I'll zoom in a little bit on the US just to complement what David said, um, which you know I, I agree with. It's really interesting to see what different countries are doing and how we're going to do it and how we're going to manage you know the nuclear question. Um, in the United States, a, a couple of things. I feel like the summary of what we can or should be doing um, in our energy systems is, is the word and. So the idea that one technology is going to solve everything, well, if you got it, I want to see it. <laughs> and please email me after this event because I would love to, to check it out. But the, the solution, the holistic solution, again, to get us to deep decarbonization, to get us where we really want to go, not some intermediate solution that, I mean, it's still better than it could be, but it's, it's not really the goal. Um, is a bunch of different technologies all working together and complementing each other. In the United States, we're in a different part of the conversation. We're not, um, you know, Thailand is considering whether or not they're going to introduce nuclear. We have plants here. We have, I think it's just under, you know, 100 operating reactors right now. I think the peak was at 104, if I'm remembering the number right. But the idea is, what do we do with those facilities? So right now, what they're doing is helping us to keep emissions down. And because we care about cumulative emissions, we care about that bathtub and are we filled it up? And is it overflowing now, that carbon bathtub? You know, it matters if we turn those things off. So the question to me is, okay, existing nuclear and what else? So the idea is, you know, after we do those lifetime extensions that we're discussing with nuclear, so we stretched it out to a point where it's, we can't just kind of kick the can down the road five more years. Do we replace those technologies? Um, do we let them retire. If we let them retire, what are we going to replace them with that is not just going to shoot our greenhouse gas emissions up? And I think that when we run the numbers, when you take nuclear out of the equation, uh, very often either the model won't solve or man, do the price estimates change. So okay. um, in the US, we have a different conversation going on. Yep. So um, that actually sort of, to some extent, also relates to a big overarching issue, which we haven't touched on much. And that's the the price of carbon and, and mm -hmm. pricing carbon in particular as a sort of policy, as a vehicle for trying to um, promote uh, renewables in particular, or actually try and decarbonize. Uh, David, what do you think about pricing carbon? Do you think actually this is an area that we're eventually going to have to start to put a price on carbon that's, and a carbon tax or something like that? Or do you think actually renewables are just going to become like the obvious thing to do anyway? From an intellectual and academic standpoint, pricing carbon is absolutely the right solution. Um, you know, the one of the fundamental problem with climate change is that, that costs are being externalized um, uh, and internalizing those costs with a tool like a carbon tax or an emissions trading program is absolutely the right thing to do from, a, from an intellectual standpoint. From a practical standpoint, it's proven much more challenging. Um, and, uh, you know, different countries have different cultures in these, uh, uh, on these issues. In the United States, we have a very strong anti-tax strain in our political culture. Uh, and so um, to reaching consensus around the imposition of carbon tax, um, you know, it's been, certainly it's been impossible to date and the prospects are not great looking forward. I think they're, the advocates for a carbon tax in the United States are hopeful that a combination of um, forces in the next couple of years might create a window. Um, I think that, you know, the betting odds are against it, but um, it's certainly, it, it is certainly an important area to be working on. Um, and, and by the way, um, I would really point, we've already mentioned, Noah, most already mentioned our colleague Noah Kaufman, but uh, others at the, at the Center on Global Energy Policy, along with Noah, are really doing some first rate work on, on this topic. And I, um, hugely, hugely important. Um, uh, a word about China on this score. So, so um, China's actually had an emissions trading uh, program for eight or nine years now, pilot program in about eight or eight provinces, about 250 million people um, uh, subject to this regime and, and is launching a nationwide program on emissions trading. Right now, the cap is not yet set. There's a lot of questions about whether it can really work from an administrative standpoint. It's not clear how important this is gonna be as a climate change program in China, but, but, but within a year or two, China could have by far the largest emissions trading program in the world. Okay, that's great. So uh, we're gonna run out of time because quite a lot of questions coming in. So I'm fielding these to you. So Melissa, you, you can say something about that if you like, but I thought I'd ask you a different question. And that is around technical barriers to deep decarbonization. So um, uh, questions come in from somebody saying, let's put all the policy on one side. What about the engineering and the technical solutions? Do we really have uh, major things that we still need to sort out in order to really 
move to renewables and decarbonize America or the rest of the world? Yeah. So I think David touched on it um, earlier when he mentioned industry. So in the power sector, it's about having the will to do it at the speed that we need to do it at. Um, it's also one of the uh, arguably easiest of the sectors to decarbonize. So it's one of those things with how do we get it done and how do we get it done in such a way that it can be the strong backbone for the other sectors. Um, in transport, you know, we have some good solutions to personal cars, um, but how do we deal with freight? How do we deal with shipping? How do we deal with balancing things around reducing air pollution and reducing greenhouse gas emissions, another form of air pollution? Um, I think for me, some of the I just big head scratchers about how we're going to do it um, questions do lie in industry, which is I'm so glad that Julio Friedman in our center and other academics and different institutions and Chris Patai, who's part of the Deep Decarbonization Pathways Project, is really saying, what are the solutions? And he's, it's interesting because He's, um, he's Canadian. They have a lot of challenges when it comes to how do we actually get industry decarbonized, oil and gas production, all of these things. How do we practically do it? Um, in terms of the power sector, which is kind of what we're focusing on tonight, um, I would say that it's about figuring out uh, seasonal storage. So how do we do that, whether it's with hydrogen, other synthetic fuels that we produce with power, creating you know, storable fuels and then converting them back to power later. But you know, when we look at the overall barriers, we've got renewables costs down. That's great. We need to complement it with firm resources. Nuclear is still really expensive. Carbon capture is not quite there, though we're seeing some tremendous progress. Um, but then on the storage side, batteries are great. They get you so far. We need to think about these long duration storage. So what do you do when the wind is not blowing very strongly for days or weeks and the sun is, you know, sun hours are short because it's winter is one example. Um, how do we do that? So there's some questions that I still think are, are far from answered, at least if we want to do it in a practical way that isn't tremendously expensive. Okay. Um, and David, I'm going to ask you a different question as well, but I mean, if you want to dive in on this, that's fine. But uh, we're also getting a question uh, about, uh, it's fine to think about these, we typically think about these uh, energy issues from a North and West perspective, you know, what, what happens in the United States in particular. Um, what are you, what are the solutions and challenges to clean energy uh, that we need to be thinking about in the context of the South and East? And are things completely different there? Do we need to come up with different solutions, do you think, going forward? And by South and East, do you mean um, developing countries in, in Asia, or is that? Yeah, uh, the East and then, of course, Africa, et cetera, and to some extent, South America as well. Uh, yeah. Do you think the solutions are going to be very different for these countries, and we need to think differently about how we approach them? I think it's a great question. I think, yes, I think there could well be some very different sets of solutions. And, you know, the one comparison that's often made is how uh, in many African countries, the landline telephone network was never built and they just jumped direct, leapfrog directly to cell phones. Um, and there's a, a possibility of a similar type of, of move in, in electricity provision, you know, never building um, electric grids of the type that we have um, in, some developed countries, but just going to distributed systems. Um, technology needs to be appropriate to the location where it exists. And so I think there's plenty of places in developing world where biomass can be done much more sustainably and used for power. So I think there's um, many, many opportunities to, uh, in this area and, and really important as I think that this is the premise of the question, not to tailor you know, um, solutions that may apply in one place in the industrial world, but don't apply as well in other places. Okay, so there's another question coming in, um, which I'm gonna field over to you, Melissa, um, which is about cooling. And we talk about, of course, power and all these things, transportation, manufacturing, but cooling as an even larger and faster growing source of power consumption than industrial heat. And this is partly, of course, gonna be exacerbated with global warming uh, certain parts of the world are going to become effectively uninhabitable and they're going to need to, if they're going to, people are going to live there, they're going to have to use air conditioning just to survive. So uh, how are we going to deal with that in terms of a, um, a way of actually doing uh, renewable cooling uh, that actually allows people to um, survive extreme heat? Yeah, I mean, I think the cooling, uh, the cooling questions, I mean, they're, they're hugely important. And it's interesting because depending on where I am in the world on a given day, um, before right now, where I'm not flying many places at all, uh, 
the questions, you know, you think of cooling and you think, oh, you mean keeping your McMansion in suburbia America cold, you know, your 3,000 square foot plus house. And I'm like, no, I mean, I'm thinking about uh, preserving food and getting food distribution networks in place. And I'm thinking about how do we get vaccines that need to be cooled into areas that, you know, don't have a really strong functioning grid. And we have some, you know, small solutions to that. But if you want comprehensive solutions of the future, there's a lot of different places where cooling is extremely important. And um, to whoever asked the question, thank you for it. I would also direct you to this year, actually, in the Lancet countdown report that we're part of in that medical journal. It's not behind a paywall. You just have to give them an email address and you can download it. We're having a section on cooling and we're talking about it and saying what needs to be done if we want to say, you know, having access to cooling resources, as you say, it's, it's very, it's vital to human health um, in certain parts of the world and will increasingly be so. Um, but it also comes into play in, well beyond our homes and our office buildings. So how do we do it in a sustainable way? Um, there are answers that are technological to supplying the electricity for those systems, but also from designing the buildings in the first place um, to actually not need as much cooling. Uh, you avoid that in the beginning and it's, it's, I don't know, a parallel to the reduce, reuse, recycle kind of movement and saying, okay, first need less to accomplish what you need and then figure out a way to supply that in a way that is low carbon. Yeah, that is amazing. We're looking at working on the design of a low carbon, um, zero carbon building for Manhattan right now for Columbia University. And it's brilliant what architects and engineers are thinking about in terms of potential solutions. Absolutely. So, um, we are sort of uh, running out of time. So we've got two minutes left. I just want a very, very quick answer to this one. Firstly, um, from uh, what about land degradation and solar? Uh, is there a sort of, are we actually screwing ourselves up as a civilization by deforesting and putting out solar power and things like that instead of actually, or thinking about other ways in which we're actually damaging the planet just by using renewables in new ways. Any thoughts on this, David? Well, I'm gonna, Melissa may know more about this than I do, but I, but I think um, we have plenty of land available for solar power without deforesting. Um, I, I don't, I don't there are very few places in the world where where I think that's a, a major issue. Um, certainly, certainly not in the United States. And um, I think deforestation, independent of solar, is a huge driver and contributor to global warming, um, which we haven't talked about much tonight. But we need to get, you know, we need to address. But but uh, the constraints on solar don't really have to do with deforestation. Um, I'm, Melissa can correct me if I'm wrong. Okay. Uh, I agree. I I right. don't think there's a strong argument uh, anywhere to say cut down um, this beautiful carbon sink forest um, to put solar panels there. That's uh, We have other options. And that's the thing about looking at the whole system and what we can holistically do. Um, when it comes to actually helping with land degradation, um, and I'll defer and basically quote my colleagues at Columbia who do much more work on this um, and at other universities in the, in globally, but uh, if we want to actually help with some of the land degradation issues we have, talking about getting energy access to all, um, that, is, that is at the heart of it. So how do we keep people from feeling like their only option is to go and um, scrap for woody biomass and other resources? How do we actually give them a different option that's better for their health and better for the climate? Okay, well, that's great. So we've got to wrap this up, I'm afraid. There've been a number of other questions coming in. I think we've had somewhere like 100 questions coming in. And so we've tried to summarize some of the common themes, but um, uh, if you want to email us your questions, then we can try and uh, respond to them uh, later on. In the meantime, I'd just like to uh, thank our speakers tonight, uh, David and Melissa, who pre presented absolutely fascinating perspectives. Um, thank you all of you out there for spending the evening with us. It's been great. Uh, those of you who have in the past joined us in that small group that we have 60 people, 80 people, that typically meets every every few weeks um, in New York City. Uh, thank you for all your support going forward. Uh, and uh, I just wanted to say that uh, what we do here at the Earth Institute, we believe is hugely important for the sustainability of the planet and the way we're gonna be able to survive as a human race. So we really need your support for that. And we thank you for any contributions you wanna make. Next time, we're gonna be having a discussion about something completely different and that's predicting volcanoes and volcanic eruptions. So um, we've got Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory <laughs> volcanologist Terry Plank and Annette Leave uh, coming for uh, the next meeting in June. It's gonna be amazing what they're doing. I think you'll find that fascinating to come and listen to as well. 
So now more than ever, we need your support. And uh, I look forward to continuing our discussion about the Earth Institute's critically important work as we go forward. But for now, thank you very much and good night and please stay safe. Good night. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, everyone. Thanks.